from a first world country to a third world country, it is a culture shock. It's difficult to adjust. You can't speak the language well. So what he said was, it was is actually you can't crack this nut, not at all. I spoke to Mr. Wong Kan Seng. He was the deputy prime minister. If I would ask you, your children, to leave the country and go somewhere else to work. How will your heart break? We speak like the Singaporeans. We eat like Singaporeans. We walk and talk like Singaporeans. It's not fair for children of the Gurkhas. We adapt and we adjust the way I do my things, the way I understand culture. It's it's so unfair. We talk about human rights, and this is uh, in a form of discrimination. I would say bye bye to Singapore, but I'm still a Singaporean inside. I look like Chinese. <laughs> I eat like Indian. I can talk like Malay. <laughs> so it's like Singapore. Amari kita rakyat Singapura sama sama menuju bahagia. Namaste. Uh, my name is Suman Kumar Rai. Um, I used to stay in Singapore. My father was uh, in the Singapore Police Force. He was a Gurkha and I was uh, two years old. Uh, I was born in Nepal. I was two years old when I went to Singapore because my father uh, was working as a Gurkha in Singapore. So my story is very relatable. A lot of people can relate to my story. Um, when I was there, I didn't know about like what exactly was my uh, real culture, my race until when I was like in primary school, I realized I'm not the same. I'm not Chinese, I'm not Malay, so I'm Nepali. So it was quite a struggle in the beginning uh, to make friends because we look different and people used to also like you know, say uh, we are in a, our own con community inside. So basically I was in Singapore for about 20, 21 years and then as a, as a student and after that I continued to study in SIM which I finished my studies in business management so and uh, so when I was uh, thinking when I was doing my O level specially I was thinking maybe okay I'm going to finish my degree here I will get a job in Singapore so I was like thinking like I will be together with my friends but only when I was doing O-Levels, uh, at that time I realized I have to go back. Uh, when my father's uh, contract ends, which is of 25 years. So, and then at that time I didn't know that uh, we had to leave everything behind and come uh, to Nepal. And when I was in Nepal, it was not easy. It was not easy because the main thing that the problem was the language barrier. Language barrier in a sense, I could speak my own mother tongue, but uh, I couldn't read well uh, and I couldn't speak fluently. So it was difficult to mingle with the uh, society and community when I was in Nepal. So that was one struggle. And another struggle is uh, when I was here in Nepal, I couldn't get the job that I want. Uh, and even if I were to have uh, worked in any company, I would not be able to get the salary and the income that I desired. So that was another struggle. So I actually come uh, from a family of four children. So I have uh, three sisters and I'm being the oldest. Uh, so my even my three sisters also had the same issue, same problem uh, in terms of uh, work, in terms of trying to get to study more. So. Especially my second sister, she couldn't study enough. Uh, I mean, she couldn't complete her tertiary education. Uh, she had to come back after she finished her O-levels. I think uh, she was uh, struggling in a sense that she wanted to finish her degree, but she couldn't do it in Singapore. She had to fly to UK to do her degree. And then... Um, well, well, she not allowed to finish her studies in Singapore. Okay, because uh, once our father's contracts end, contract ended, she, when she wanted to study diploma, actually the ICA did not approve of her student visa because as written in the policy, I have no idea what is exactly it is, but we were not allowed a student visa once our father's uh, contract ends. So we had no idea about this. 
we don't know anything about this. My my father used to say, my dad used to say, oh, you are uh, you are not going to be here permanent. But at that time, how would we know? We are 14, 15, 16 years old. We were, we, we were uh, in that age, teenage life. We were making good friends. We were growing up in that society with the same culture. We thought like we are in that culture and then we would have the same kind of treatment. But in the end, like you have to leave behind everything and then come to Nepal from a first world country and then come to a third world country. It is a culture shock because it's very difficult, very difficult to adjust because uh, when we are in Nepal, we can't speak the language well and we have to leave all our good friends behind. And after, especially for me, after I uh, finished my education, so when I wanted to work there, every time there is company willing to hire me, they are applying for my S-Pass or E-Pass for uh, with the Ministry of Manpower. It always get uh, rejected. They wouldn't say why, but they'll just say we, uh, we have put into considerable consideration and uh, we uh, regret to inform you uh, your visa is not approved or you are not going to be given this uh, working visa. Did they ever tell you uh, why your application was rejected? No, they don't. So that's the reason why sometimes uh, there were twice I went to ICA uh, minister. Uh, at that time was Mr. Hawazi Daipi. He was actually in charge of ICA. I went to speak to him. Mm -hmm. So what is the problem? Because I studied here, I, uh, I have good friends here and I'm educated, I'm ready to work, I am skilled, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not stupid, you know. I will tell, uh, I, will, uh, I told him that. And then he, he said, um, you should know your father's uh, contract. But the thing is, my father, mm -hmm. I think a lot of fathers are not educated enough to read the fine prints. What is written there? And at the end, what exactly happens? They don't know uh, 100%. So some of our fathers, let's say uh, they who can't read properly, mm -hmm. or who can't read everything and understand the contract, they are not able to explain to their children. So for, for me, my father was say, we will say, we are like a guest here. We are staying here for some time. And then we have to go back to our country. And at that time, I'm still young. I'm still, no, I'm not going to go back to, uh, go, go, go to Nepal. I, I want to stay here. Uh, I'm, I, I, want to, I want to work here. I want to, uh, so that was my argument with my father all the time. But little did I know how uh, strict, you know, uh, is the uh, is the law policy in Singapore. And then I realized how difficult it is because after I uh, spoke to Mr. Hawazi Daipi, and uh, he told me it is not easy, and it's a very hard nut to crack. Uh, so what he said was, it was is actually you can't crack this nut, nut at all. So, you know, uh, and then I spoke to Mr. Wong Kan Seng. He was a deputy prime minister. I went to his office and he was uh, telling me, uh, listen, you know, you had the education. So everything, you should be grateful for the education you have already gotten. So we have made you equipped to face the world. You can go any country. You, you have studied this much. You can go to any country, get a job. I mean, easy to say. But you know, I even told told him, uh, sir, if I if I would ask you your to tell your children to leave the country and go somewhere else to work, how will your heart break? It's the same thing. Will your children approve, or will your children say, okay, fine, I will go to Australia, maybe I will study there? So I posed these questions to him, and then it came down to the fact that where you are born your race, your culture, your blood, it all came into that. Uh, in, into that. So I was, I was telling myself, why was I born? Why wasn't I born a Singaporean? Why wasn't I born here? You know, and then I had all these kind even, of... Even if you were born there, you, you have friends who are children of Gurkhas. Yes. Even they are not allowed. Yes. The same, so uh, given the same option. Exactly. So I was thinking, it's not about that. It's yeah. about how unfair it is for us because we you know in Singapore 
the main resource is labor force. It's the main resource. Singapore doesn't have any other uh, natural resource. Like in Nepal, we have uh, minerals, water, gold, all this, right? But in Singapore, there's only labor. Uh -huh. Labor is the main resource. So in Singapore, they sell labor for as an income, right? So for us, it's like we work, we are a ready labor force, but we are not given the opportunity to work. You know, when I was in Singapore, we were taught like, oh, um, we have to give back to society. We have to give back to society. Yes, we want to give back to society, but give us a chance. So that is what I was telling the minister, uh, deputy uh, prime minister, Mr. Wong Kan Singh. I said, give us this opportunity uh, to, you know, give back to society. If there's no chance for us, then how can we prove that, like, we can do something? You know, because yes, you have inculcated the value. You have given us the teachings and we speak like the Singaporeans, we eat like Singaporeans, we walk and talk like Singaporeans, but in the end, it boils down to the fact that it's not fair. I, it's just like, it's not fair for children of the Gurkhas. I think it, 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 should, it should be fair if like the children are given opportunity to at least do something, give, uh, give to society in a way, like give them a chance to work and give them a chance for a better life as well. So when I was, uh, when I was given, a, a given uh, like uh, by Mr. Wong, Wong Kan Seng was saying, uh, we, are, we have given you this chance, so you have to be thankful. So how can I be thankful when like, it's like you are giving us, uh, you are making us ready for society and uh, work life and uh, you, are, you, you have given us every step that is needed to face the career world the you know uh, so that we can we can do something with our lives but once you will tell us to leave you know what we what is uh, so unfair we have to readapt when we if let's say even if i were to go go to uk i have to readapt and readjust the way i do my things the way i understand culture so it's like Whatever I have learned in that 18 to 19 years, it goes down the drain. So, and the friends that I made, you know, a lot of things are more intangible than tangible. It's about the emotions. It's about how much we, how much we adore, cherish the life that we have. And then you suddenly like remove that from our lives. It feels, it's, it's so unfair. We talk about human rights. You know? Right, so when you talk about human rights, you can give us uh, the right to choose how we want to live our life in a better way and how you have uh, given us the uh, education system and everything is all given to us like how other Singaporeans are given. So, but at the end, you just, uh, you just tell us to what your father's contract has ended, you have to go. So I think this was not fair. This is not right. So basically, even even though you stayed in Singapore for about twenty years and you were edu educated in Singapore, you had qualifications to work in get a job in yes. Singapore. Yes, but there were three you companies. Were, you were not allowed to work in Singapore just yes. because your father was a Gurkha. Yes. So and do you do you feel uh, you have been discriminated in any way? This this is uh, in a form of discrimination. Uh, because uh, I think it is uh, what you're saying about discrimination is when it comes to the right of choice to work because I had like four different companies willing to hire me and then they all applied for my uh, work pass as pass and it got rejected but if let's say uh, someone who is not so educated as uh, I'm not saying that other people are not educated for example, for a lower work, uh, working job title, for example, you bring in people from the Philippines. Singapore brings in people from the Philippines and then they can't speak as well uh, English as us children of the Gurkhas. And then we, we understand like how we should live our life, how we should carry ourselves, how we should walk, how we should talk, how to mingle with uh, the local market, right? In Singaporeans. But you hire people from the Philippines, example, or you get uh, you uh, you get people from India or Bangladesh or wherever other countries. But their education is not so qualified, but they are getting the job. Yeah. So 
that's why my boss uh, who well, wanted to be my boss he said like this is so bloody unfair we have a ready workforce he is educated he is smart he can contribute to my company but i can't hire him why and then i told i told him john his name was john john is very difficult because even for studies we can't continue our studies if our father's uh, contract is ended about uh, uh, if you were to say like work is a different whole story mm-hmm. so just a simple fundamental right of tri- uh, of education is also not given this is a fundamental right of, of education if let's say if for example my sister who was willing to study and she she had uh, my father was financing he had enough money to pay for the school fees she was rejected of a student visa even this fundamental right of education was also denied for my sister and for me i thought like um, when i was uh, all this all the times i was thinking to myself for 3 years 4 years i think 4 uh, years it took me some time to get used to it like okay fine uh, i'll say bye bye to singapore but i'm still a singaporean inside so i will still have friends who speaks to me on facebook or instagram or whatsapp i still contact uh, i keep in contact with them and then they, uh, they will update me about the uh, situation in singapore how much progress has been done so i still keep in touch with them and then i do go and visit sometimes like uh, once in a year or once in two years to meet my friends and to see how singapore is and to remember how what kind of life i had because uh now i'm just a tourist in singapore right so there were, it took me 4 years to okay totally okay I'm, i i can't work here anymore i cannot have my life move forward here so that's the reason why uh in nepal i started uh, i met uh, my partner uh and we started this uh, restaurant and then even this restaurant is uh it is something to do with singapore because Uh, Singapore is in our hearts like I said. So especially food in Singapore what uh, was the most important for us was the food. And so that's why we started this small restaurant uh, to remember Singapore. And so we have our own uh, Singaporean food menu. And so is uh, that's the reason why I feel like when I'm here I'm thinking about the food in Singapore. I'm thinking about oh the next day why what should I have or oh, chicken rice, duck rice, all these kind of things. So I put myself in the younger sisters and brothers who are in my situation right now who I was when I was in that situation now they are in that situation so that's the reason why that we opened this restaurant is for these brothers and sisters to come and you know be themselves be Singaporean you know that's why uh, when we have uh, this uh, brothers and sisters coming in uh, uncles and aunts who are ex gurkhas who come in we are so happy because we speak the same the way the way we talk the way we you know walk so that's why because they will remember oh i once had this kind of food when i was in singapore oh i once had this kind of interaction this kind of uh, conversation when i was in singapore so we are giving making this small little place like a meet up place for people like me people like us who have uh, who have been unfairly treated in one way and uh, so when i got here with uh, my family it was not easy the struggle was the language barrier um if given a choice would i stay of course because it's like the best childhood memories was in singapore if people were to tell me about oh if you had a choice to stay or study in singapore i would say yes because i still remember and i was still i, I will say it with no regrets I would want to stay in Singapore. I would want to have a life uh in Singapore because that is where I grew up. That was where I was also participating in all the parades. National Day is coming August 9. It will always hold a uh, will hold a place in my heart because I will always remember because I was in St John's uh Brigade Brigade St John's SJAB they call it St John's Ambulance Brigade. I was actually a medical officer there. So when I was uh, in Singapore during the August 9th National Day parade we used to go to the indoor stadium and then we used to have our own platoon and we used to also do uh, you know uh, like the parade in parade out being 
a part of National Day Parade. But I'm not a Singaporean, but I enjoyed it. And then I remember how it used to be the rehearsals, standing there for two hours, three hours. But this is nothing compared to what our fathers did. They have to stand for longer hours. So I put myself in such a, a CCA. Well, now they call it CCA. Last time was ECA. Now they call it CCA. It's because so that I can understand a little bit of what our fathers did, what my dad did. So being a uh, being in St John's Ambulance Brigade was also a wonderful memory because uh, I learned how to be a paramedic. I learned to give first aid, and then after that, I started to be a training officer. And then you see all of these things I will never forget. And I was I am 38 years old now. This was when I was 16 years old. 16, 17, 18, 19 years old. Until 19 years old, I was an alumni for St. John's Evans Brigade. And I still remember all the parades, or even like every sports day, we used to be there providing first aid. So all of these memories will always stick in the memory and in the heart. So I have to let go of all of this and I have to start a new life in Nepal. And in Nepal, it was, uh, it was not easy in the beginning. And the reason why I don't want to work with any company is because they are not paying you enough for the education that you have. So this is one of the reasons why my sisters are not here with me in Nepal, is because you can't get that income that you desire. And you can't get back how much you have invested in your education when you are in Nepal working for someone else. Inflation is high in Nepal. My father was working, so I am lucky in a way. But the thing is, the children are not lucky because they have to go to different countries, right? To maybe get a job. And most of them are not getting the job that they want. The job that they, uh, they really, it, their ambition is, if let's say they want to be a doctor, they can't be a doctor or maybe if they want to be um, in a big corporate company, some of them are becoming a cashier or a sales assistant. Mm -hmm. Do you think that is the way of life that we wanted it to be? No, because this was something that was like snatched from us. Yeah. So, so it was given yeah. the opportunity to stay in Singapore, you would happily live in Singapore of and work in Singapore, right? Yes, definitely, and, because yeah. uh, it is something that like is almost in the blood now yeah it's almost uh, in the mindset yeah. uh, it's about how uh, you become a Singaporean yourself mm -hmm. even my friends were saying you are more Singaporean than the Singaporeans here. Yeah. So that's why I would say like I eat I look like Chinese mm -hmm. I eat like Indian I can talk like Malay <laughs> so it's like Singaporean. Amari kita rakyat Singapura sama-sama menuju bahagia. I do remember the pledge. It's saying we, the citizens of Singapore, pledge ourselves as one united people, regardless of race, language, or religion. You know. So it's about equality. And then, when I was young, I used to say the pledge, but my teacher said, "No, don't say it." I was like thinking, why? Because I was still young. You know? I was in primary two, P two, so I was like seven, eight years old. So I was like, I used to, everyone is saying except me. So you are not allowed to say that this? Yeah, the, my teacher was saying, you don't have to say, don't say. Did, uh, did, did they tell you any reason? No. For stopping you? First, no. I think they were afraid of uh, opening the, the door, the floodgate to discrimination. Mm -hmm. uh, and then like, they didn't want to explain to me exactly why. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, but I used to say it like secretly, you know. We, the citizens of Singapore, that's us. Awesome. I used to say it secretly. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after I, I, I really wanted to stay there. I really, uh, because when I was 14, 15 years old, my father said, we have to go back. We have to go back. So uh, you have to say bye bye to your friends. You have to say bye bye. You have to move, you know. And I said like, I don't want to go. I was stubborn. So I tried everything that I can and to be like a Singaporean walk, talk like a Singaporean, say the blessed, get uh, involved in uh, uh, National Day Parades. And also, uh, there was this activity called uh, social work. You go to like uh, elderly homes or orphanage, and then you uh, do like programs, bring food to the orphans. 
So I did everything like this so that you know I can get more points. <laughs> but after I, re- I realized, like these points don't matter <laughs> because it becomes a zero, nothing. In Singapore, they call it kono, means zero. So I didn't realize until like I really wanted to be there, but I could not. That's a sad. Part. But if given a choice, of course, I would stay in Singapore. I want to study there and I want to continue my life there because. My friends, uh, most of them that I, friends that I know and grew up with, are all there, and they want me there. But it's actually the government policy that the contract that our father signs. I think main. I I don't know what is written in the contract. I am educated enough to understand the contract, but it's not given to me. And I hope that the future workers uh, who go there, they truly understand what they are signing. And they truly read all the fine prints and make sure it does not hamper uh, their future. Or if, let's say, um, they insist on going to be a gorka, like I want to be a gorka, I want my life uh, uh, to move on there. I want to make my children's life good for my family. Go, go, go ahead, but plan it well, so that uh, you know uh, you don't have to face. Uh, such hardship and such struggles, like how we struggled, and I want. Uh, I think uh, the contract should be revised, and I think the policy should be revised, so that uh, certain things like human rights, simple matters such as human rights, uh, should also be inculcated and put in there. So, yeah, that's about it. I think uh, this is just a tip of the iceberg. So there's a lot more. Thank you. Okay, with that, thank you so much. We'll end this conversation here. We'll keep in touch and uh, we'll share more in the next. Thank you.